Okay, we're up to 70 and still climbing. So uh, it's time to start. Thank you everybody for uh, attending this uh, talk, which of course we'd hope to have in situ in uh, a Society of Antiquaries, but uh, that's been denied us, that pleasure's been denied us. But fortunately, the scholarly content of tonight's lecture will come through just as clearly as it would have if we'd been in the Antiquaries. It'll probably reach more people uh, in this way as well, uh, this online format, which we're all a bit sick of, but also uh, appreciate the merits of. Uh, before I start and before I introduce Roger Stelly, uh, let me remind you and, and inform you if you haven't been to one of these lectures before that if you've got a question or a comment uh, at the end of the lecture, please type it into the question and answer box, not the chat box, okay? So thank you very much for, for uh, sticking to that. All right, with those preliminaries, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Roger Stulley. Uh, for some of us, uh, for many of us, I imagine he doesn't need introduction, but for some people here and perhaps uh, more than half, he will, because we haven't seen as much of Roger at the BAA in recent years as we would have liked to. Roger, if I'm not wrong, your last really substantial involvement was probably convening the 2008 conference and, and then editing the transactions. Uh, in which were published, I think, in 2011 or 2012. Yeah. Uh, Julian, you're making me feel very guilty. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. we like you, we like you, Roger, and we'd like to see That's you. Me too. <laughs> in any case, I'm not meaning to lay a guilt trip <laughs> on you. I just took a bit of context for people. Yeah. Anyway, Roger is a fellow emeritus in the history of art at Trinity College Dublin, where he's worked for many years. He's a member of the Royal Irish Academy and Academia Europa, and he's an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland as well. Uh, over the past 50 years, he's done more than anyone else to improve understanding of uh, Irish, not just Irish, I might say, but in particular, Irish architecture and sculpture, also manuscript painting. I mean, he's written on the Book of Kells as well, but uh, yeah, Irish architecture and uh, sculpture, and we're going to have a talk tonight on an aspect of uh, his research, very important group of sculptures, which we'll all be familiar with, but might not know very much about the Irish High Crosses. And Roger's been working on these for quite a while now and uh, has published various uh, books and articles to do with them. So the title of the lecture is Early Irish Sculpture and the Art of the Irish High Crosses. Thank you very much, Roger. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julian, um, and uh, hello to everybody. Delighted to, to join you all. Um, very sorry that we, we can't celebrate the new year uh, together, um, but uh, well, maybe in a few months time we'll be able to. But um, I wonder if I could just uh, indulge in a, a tiny piece of personal history just before I, I, I really begin. I want to take you back to the summer of 1969. Um, at that point, I, I'd been summoned for an interview in, in Dublin for a lectureship. And um, so I did what I suppose is the sensible thing. I, I went and informed my then supervisor, none other than George Donetsky, who always a, a source of wonderful advice and in these circumstances. And George in his own very sort of inimitable way asked, well, Roger, what do you know about Irish art? And of course, the answer was absolutely nothing. And George's response was, you have two weeks to find out. And um, well, I still cannot quite comprehend how that two weeks has turned into what I think is now 52, 52 years. But um, certainly, I benefited from George's advice and who knows without his advice, I may never have ventured into the realm of uh, Irish art and Irish uh, sculpture. But anyway, better get down to business and uh, uh, with the, the Great Crosses of Ireland. They reckon to be about 300, maybe more, 300 freestanding stone crosses in Ireland, uh, amongst which is a, a relatively small group with figure sculpture, some of which are really 
truly mega monuments outstanding in terms of their scale and indeed their engineering, but equally remarkable uh, for, oh, what have I done there? I'm not, there we are, sorry. Um, it's going too quickly for me. Anyway, as I say, equally remarkable for the, the quality of their, their carving uh, and the fact that a fair number of them survive really in, in very good condition. And uh, not surprisingly, of course, they've been studied fairly intensively for the best part of 150 years. Though plenty of questions remain, and indeed there are some, I think, quite fundamental questions really, that have never been considered at all. Now, the crosses really came into the limelight in the middle years of the 19th century, particularly uh, following the great exhibition, the great industrial exhibition that was held in Dublin in 1853. And that included uh, a number of plaster cars, but actually also included some uh, real crosses, which were dragged presumably in carts across the country for the show. And connected with that exhibition, following shortly afterwards, was a book by a certain Henry O'Neill, uh, which you can see an illustration of there on the, on the screen, um, his book, Illustrations of Sculptural Crosses of Ancient Ireland, it was embellished with these wonderful lithographs, romantic lithographs, along with the text that proclaimed the crosses as relics of a great Irish civilization. And of course, as he went on to explain, a civilization obliterated by the dastardly Normans and their English successors. Well, actually, he didn't, I think, use the word dastily, but it was certainly his prose was along those lines. And to O'Neill and his admirers, the crosses provided clear evidence that Ireland had an advanced civilization at a time, of course, when, in his understanding, the rest of Europe was sunk in barbarism. And the book had a great impact, not surprisingly. And before long, uh, high crosses and ringed crosses in particular, the so-called Celtic cross, as it came to be known as, uh, began to be, or its meaning rather, began to be transformed because it was no longer seen just as a Christian symbol, a relic of the Middle Ages, but a symbol of Ireland, a symbol of, of Irish nationalism. And by 1900, the, uh, by then, uh, high crosses were literally, as it were, invading the graveyards of Ireland like a relentless army. Here is Glasnevin on the outskirts of Dublin. And they soon began to sp spread across the world. And they're still on the move. Here on the right, you see a cross that I encountered almost by accident some years ago in St. Louis, Missouri, a very recent one uh, erected as the uh, inscription puts it to the Irish who immigrated in memory of the Irish or a tribute to the Irish who immigrated to St. Louis over the years. Uh, it's interesting that in all these replicas, the figure sculpture is of the ancient crosses is virtually ignored uh, and they became much more in terms of religion, perhaps slightly more neutral uh, monuments as a result. Now, while uh, O'Neill was right to extol the beauty of the monuments. He was, perhaps not surprisingly, um, baffled by the, um, the meaning of some of the, some of the crosses. And I think I've jumped to there, that's it. Um, uh, and uh, two cases which, uh, well, it, it, in a way, it's not surprising that he was because we can certainly sympathize with him because there are quite a number of panels on the crosses which are pretty hard to, uh, uh, to fathom and, and comprehend. And as I say, here are two of them. This is the great tall cross at uh, Monaster Boyce. And uh, on uh, the capstone right up at the top there, on either side, there are two rather worn carvings. Um, and there have been a variety of suggestions as to what they might represent, some quite extraordinary, all I think equally unconvincing, uh, at the top there, you see a seated figure. Is it an animal and there's something? Is it an altar or what is it down below at the right? And on the, the, uh, on the other panel, the other side of the, 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 uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the top there, a figure set behind a very large animal uh, holding some, apparently some sort of frame. And as I say, nobody's really come up with um, an excuse or uh, sorry, an explanation really of what these might might represent. But when we turn to um, 
the the uh sorry there's something going slightly wrong with my there we are with my forward and back but anyway back to business um when we actually look at the, these these are the two great crosses at monaster boys and uh, the array of carving really is, is absolutely stupendous all four faces of of the stone covered with uh, sculpture in the case of the cross you see on the left there the tall cross uh, with figure sculpture on all four sides with Muradat's cross at some 20 odd scenes in fact figural scenes uh, majority of them very well preserved now as i say most of the subjects over the years have been identified chiefly by way of comparison in other words by reference to works in the established canon of christian iconography but one thing which is really interesting to me recently is the, the, the dangers of that approach. It can, and indeed I think it has been, pushed a bit too far. In other words, quite obscure or uncertain compositions have been made to fit, and you can see why it's so temptation. Come what may, they must, as it were, surely fit somewhere into the familiar patterns of Christian iconography. It's what I call the iconographic straitjacket. Um, and I think it's very important that we've got to think a little bit more broadly and be ready on occasions to certainly acknowledge innovation, particularly within Ireland, and a fair degree of adaptation as well. And that's particularly in the light of the fact that by the time these crosses were made, Ireland, of course, had been a Christian country for over 400 years with a huge reputation for Christian learning. As we know uh, from uh, from, from Bede in particular, the, the Anglo-Saxons back in the seventh century had traveled to Ireland in great numbers to study in the monastic schools. And the wealthier monasteries were proud possessors of, well, spectacular liturgical treasures. And I think we must presume too, considerable reservoirs of Christian imagery, whether in the form of illuminated manuscripts or whether in perhaps even wooden sculpture, because we don't really know. But I think we, what we mustn't forget is that sculpture on these crosses came out of Christian communities that had long and very well established traditions of their own. And there's no reason, I think, to suppose that they felt the need to look abroad as is often uh, supposed that they did. Now, while iconography has uh, dominated the agenda in recent years, there are plenty of other issues beside iconography, which, which I think are really interesting. And uh, one, of course, is the identity of the sculptors themselves. And I've forgotten why I had that one on. Sorry, I'll stick with that. Um, and uh, uh, their background, their training, particularly, and the individual techniques they used. And we have no names, of course, uh, but some can be quite clearly identified as individuals on the basis of their style. And several were clearly employed at more than one site, which makes it very interesting because you can actually begin to work out a, an herb for them. Now there have been suggestions that some are foreigners, migrants from Gaul, or perhaps local artisans, at least with a direct access to uh, Carolingian imagery, that at least has been one of the major claims. Um, of course, how on earth did knowledge of Carolingian works reach, reach Ireland. Well, of course, the solution that's always put for, forward there is the uh, that most illusory of medieval artifacts, the pattern book. Um, not a view, I think, or, or not an idea that the evidence really appears to, to support. And then, um, as well as the actual sculptors themselves and as individuals and as craftsmen, there's also the question of how the crosses were made. And this is an area which really has been very much neglected or to the extent that nobody's much considered uh, certainly the engineering behind them because they're massive undertakings. They're, as I say, the, 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 the construction has, has never really been scientifically looked at. And it's quite clear that these, I like to call them mega monuments, that they're not humble commissions by self, by, by pious self-effacing uh, abbots motivated by a wish to educate the faithful. And that's what the usual view is. I couldn't resist, I'm not sure I dare, would dare have shown this in, in Ireland, but as you can see here, quote, the high crosses, which may have been used to tell the stories from the Bible to a congregation, and there they all are. But um, 
It's, as I say, these are proud, ambitious monuments, in my mind, erected on behalf of no doubt proud and ambitious uh, individuals, uh, individuals wielding very considerable power. And of course, this then leads to the whole question of audience and function. So often this term preaching crosses has been used, but the nature of the imagery, as so often with medieval art, um, really seems to be aimed at uh, the well-informed and, and the knowledgeable. Now, given that the scale and the, 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 the prominence of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the crosses, and there's several, many of the sites at Tom McNoise and here at Monaster Voice, uh, the assumption is they must have played some role in the whole liturgical life of the monasteries. And that really is one of the, the areas we really know so little about and can really only guess. That's not to say that there may not have been occasions when indeed they were used as some sort of a in didactic context to help teach, but um, they're really not very suitable for that. The scenes rarely follow what we might at least consider a coherent or consistent narrative sequence. You've got to move around. It's a very strange shape because they're kind of pinned almost to the cross. Um, John Mitchell had a lovely way of putting it. He said the crosses, the Irish crosses, almost look as somebody has just pinned to a cross a whole series of panel paintings as if they'd be taken down an iconostasis and pin them all around. And of course, that's exactly what it is. It's, a, it's not the easiest of frame framework to actually show uh, imagery. And many, of course, are high off the ground. And that's why I'm showing that slide or picture on the left, uh, not that easy to see. Um, and of course, this whole notion of a, of a didactic purpose doesn't take much allowance for perhaps the Irish weather. So it's never quite as bad as people seem to think, but I'm to move on. Uh, now, uh, as for the style, turning perhaps more, more uh, specifically just to the structure the construction, um, you can see here, this is a rather crude diagram just to try and show the size of the block that was needed for most of the cross at Monaster Boys, Weirdat's cross. There are three pieces of the stone. There's the base, the main substance, the shaft and the ring, and then up at the top, um, the, the capstone. And um, as you can see, its dimensions are pretty massive. Over four, it's over four meters. It would have had to have been actually, because that makes no allowance for the tenons which projected um, upwards. And the other thing, it's not just um, in terms of height and width, it's also depth. It's uh, some 50 centimeters deep. That's over, what's that, foot and a half or so, which allows, of course, for the sides to be, uh, have fairly elaborate uh, panels as well. And calculating roughly on the basis of the, the size of the block and the weight of sandstone, it must have been about 10 tons when it was actually extracted from the, the quarry. And the stone itself actually, is a, a, that's been a mystery in, it, in itself because it's, it's a very fine quartzy sandstone which uh, uh, has held its detail extremely well over the years. And for its, it's long been a, a puzzle as to where this came from because geologically there's nothing like the stone anywhere near Monaster Boyce. And uh, it's not through want of trying to find it. And the nearest location where um, stone of, of this type is at a place called Carrick Lex, some 14 miles away uh, inland. And um, I owe this very much to my geological colleagues in, in Trinity. And um, one of them in particular was in, absolutely insistent that uh, the quarry at Carrick was the best bet. And that's more or less being confirmed now uh, because we've had samples from Carrick Lek. Um, we obviously can't take samples from the crosses at Monaster Boys, but there are fragments of crosses from the site. And indeed they match um, pretty well effectively. Uh, so it, 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 and as I say, Carrick Lek is the nearest place where you've got a great uh, sandstone um, outcrop. In fact, it's, it, it's, it's, what's very interesting is the name because in, in, uh, in Irish, Carrick and Lek, it literally means the stone bed. And as the name goes right back into the Middle Ages, it's quite clear that this was a well-established quarry, um, certainly back to the, uh, 
uh, to the 14th, 15th century, and almost certainly uh, mu much earlier than that. And again, something which, which really heightens the importance of the quarrying is the fact that the stone at Castle Kieran and at Kells to the south, several crosses at Kells, and you see the Castle Kieran cross. This is one of three crosses at the site, which, which is a, what is a relatively plain cross, as you can see. But these all appear to be made uh, from uh, of stone from Carrick from Carrick Lek. Um, uh, so it seems to be in a kind of source of, of, of supply for uh, over the whole whole region. Now the route from Carrick Lek to Monaster Voice is not an easy one because there's no river which would uh, make the journey uh, straightforward. It had to be overland, and the the prospects of you know trying to shift a ten ton piece of stone uh, makes you think. And obviously, one thing where they could simplify matters would be to rough the stone out at the quarry. And that's the obvious thing to have done. And one assumes that's exactly what was done. And um, I think, too, presumably the same would have been done at Kells and Castle Kieran. So if that is the case, it means that um, a lot of the design, the basic design of the cross, the layout of the cross, must actually have been done at the, the, the quarry. And I've, um, one might actually wonder too whether the chief sculptor, the, whoever he was, the person in charge, might also have been much involved in the quarrying because there's not much evidence outside cross making for, uh, as it were, semi professional uh, quarrying um, at this time. Now, if, uh, if that, is, that is the case, and a rough outline was, was made at the quarry. Um, well, we've got some hint of what that might look like because there's a broken cross at Kells. It's an unfinished, described as the unfinished cross. It was actually re-erected from bits uh, in the years around 1900. And it looks as though it was a cross which was abandoned long before it was finished. And you can see how panels, which were clearly destined for figure sculpture, have been left uh, projecting, but with a, a, a flat surface. And again, one might well ask, is that, was that work, that initial work, uh, laying out the various panels and the depth of the relief, was that too also done at the quarry? And um, it it's, seems to me perfectly possible and perhaps even likely uh, that it was. But the impression one gets from all this is that in this, over a period of a few decades, this quarry at Carrot Lek must have been an absolute hive of activity, a, a quite significant industrial center, really, a sort of cross, cross factory, you, you, you might say. Well, once the block reached uh, the, the monastery, in this case, uh, well, the case I'm talking about, Monaster Boys, problems are far from over because, first of all, how were they carved? Were they carved lying flat on the ground or near the ground or were they erected? Uh, and then carve with them uh, as it was standing upright. That that would be difficult in many cases because there's some carving which would be very difficult to get at. Uh, but a much more fundamental question is um, how did they lift them into place? Now with Murdoch's cross, that was just made of the basically the one huge huge block which had to be lifted into the base. But the other cross at Monaster Boys, the tall cross, as you see here, made of three uh, well two major pieces: a shaft. Um, and the ringed head, and then finally a, a separate catstone up on the top. But the point that I'm making is that they were fixed together by mortise and tenon joints. And my, forgive my rather crudest looking diagram on the right, I've tried to explain how uh, the tall cross was put together. And what, of course, you can never see when they're complete or semi-complete is you can't see the tenon because it's lost uh, out of sight in the, the mortise. But uh, I've tried to reconstruct roughly what it uh, would have looked like um, in, in this case. But the, um, the, the, the issue you've got um, here, well, there's, there's several really. The high level joint is a pretty risky thing to do, uh, partly because at the top or top of the shaft, you, you're, you've got really only rather thin surrounding piece of, uh, pieces of stone um, in a broken cross also at the site. Uh, the width is about seven centimeters. So you've got a thin rim around uh, the tenon as it, as it falls into the, into the slot. And you can imagine, given the weight of the 
top of the cross, the ring cross and all that, that many of them were fractured. All told, I think there are about 20 crosses in Ireland which are made with this high level joint. And in nearly every case, they've either fallen or there's clear signs that they've been repaired. And that's the case here because, although you can't see it very clearly here where I've got the red arrow, um, certain bits of the, uh, of the shaft have been removed. Obviously, I think to remake the, the mortise at some stage, um, a stage that isn't known, uh, the data which isn't known uh, historically. But then the other thing to bear in mind that height, um, because uh, when you're slotting something into, as I say, into the mortise, the tenon into the mortise, it's got to be done vertically. And that means uh, one thing with the shaft, difficult enough, but with that ringed head, that would have to be lifted, well, it, its present height is 21 feet, so it would probably have to be lifted up upwards 25 feet. We're looking at a hoist uh, of, on, of, on a fairly big scale. And um, just to give you some idea, the magnitude of this, this is a far smaller cross, which was uh, moved at Clonmac Noise in the 1990s. And it gives you some idea of the structure which was needed um, at that time. And the general consensus is that the sort of hoist that must have been in use would have been the type described by Vitruvius, the three-legged tripod, um, as it were. But um, it must have been on quite a substantial scale. And one area we know really nothing about is where pulleys used. And indeed, what about ropes? Because the ropes to bear the sort of weights we're talking about must have been a very impressive uh, quality. Now, I think it's well worth going through some of these uh, very practical structural uh, elements, because to me, it demonstrates that making crosses on this scale was far from a simple everyday exercise. They're complicated projects at times involving a very considerable workforce. And again, underlining that these were commissioned presumably by individuals with very considerable authority and influence. So turning now just from the, the making of the, uh, the crosses to the, the master sculptor, because what is really interesting is the person who's, or the, or, or the style, the technique, you, you can see at Monaster Voice on both those crosses, it clearly is by the same individual. It, it's so close, it's, it's, it's an excellent match. And in fact, you can plot his work at about five, six, perhaps even seven other places across the Irish Midlands, and I've marked them out here. Um, Kells, possibly the best bet for where this person started out. And Clonmac Noise, certainly the Clonmac Noise Cross of the Scriptures is like, in some ways, an abbreviated version of one of those at, uh, at Monaster Boys. I like to call in the Weird at Master. And I do that quite deliberately because I think if you try and give him a name, it, we can begin to think of the person as more of a, a as an individual. We can almost, as it were, try and construct some sort of biography for him. But people have queried what I've said, and on the lines that you know, five or six crosses, surely that's not possible. It's too many crosses for for one man. But I would prefer to turn that argument on its head and say, actually. I think it makes much more sense because to our eyes, and I suspect to the eyes of those who were commissioning crosses at this time, this man was technically so superior to others, sculptors, and I'll try and prove that in a moment, that it's no wonder he was in high demand. And once the first cross, whichever one it was, was completed, it's no surprise really that there would be um, that others would want to cut a cut of the action. And um, even more, perhaps valuable, here is his work, you can see it clear. We know, um, thanks to an inscription, which you see down there below, uh, exactly when he worked, because it carries, this is Muradat's cross, carries an inscription, pray for, I think that's my, oh no, I must have, have I gone past it somewhere? No, what have I done? Well, it's coming up in a moment. Anyway, uh, it gives us an inscription which, which mentions the name Muirdac, uh, and we know that Abbot Muirdac died in 924. So we've really, it's not just we've got a group of, of, of crosses by an individual. We know roughly when they were carved in the early years of the, ninth, of the 10th century, presumably. 
Um, anyway, here is a, a closer view of, of uh, what his work looks like. Um, you can see here, we're looking actually here on the right at a uh, scene from Murat's Cross, The Mocking of Christ. And you see Christ holding a reed. You can see he's dressed as a king using a penannular brooch there on the, the chest underlying his regal status. It's, it's quite deep relief. The figures are very rounded, well proportioned to notice the way the soldiers walk towards Christ um, and almost tiptoeing to along the frame. And one of the features of this particular sculptor is his delight in uh, local contemporary details, brooches, swords, and uh, these rather strange short trousers, which you can see sort of uh, uh, very close fitting pants, which the two soldiers uh, have. Um, He's the only person where this, where we see this, and it crops up in two other crosses. It's very much uh, one of his his own little tricks, apparently. And we see many of the same features here on the left. This is again still Murat's cross, um, the fallen man, as you can see, Adam Eve. Very well rounded figures of Adam uh, and Eve, as you can uh, see clearly uh, there. Now, if if you've doubt about this whole business of um, you know, stylistic comparison and drawing distinctions. On the right, we have, uh, again, Fall of Man, slightly different iconography here, but this is from the Broken Cross at Kells, which can't be that far apart in terms of date, I think, from the Muradat Master, but you can see it's, there are worlds apart, the large heads, the figures just seem to be floating, none of that firm, rounded sort of relief that we get with the Muradat master. Whether the broken cross is early or later, well, that's, 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 that's tricky. And one can see uh, the same man's uh, work here at Clumac Noise, the cross and scripture, so-called cross. Again, this very full relief, which you see, and I've just got this individual panel on the, the north side of the, uh, of the cross. It's a fantastic carving to my mind, an enthroned figure, not, clear who it is or who it's intended to be. The assumption has always been that it's David, but I, but I have doubts about that. You can see the enthroned figure is, is got a staff and it's piercing some unfortunate prostate individual. It, it's going pretty well straight in the eye, which is interesting. And I think possibly quite deliberate uh, if, if indeed, as I think it probably is, that's meant to be an unbeliever or heretic or uh, you know, somebody representing paganism. Um, I tend to see this more as a, uh, a panel conveying the idea of the conquest of unbelief. But it is a very interesting composition because ultimately it's derived from, I think, uh, uh, late Roman carving. I'm thinking particularly of the, uh, well, emperors or consuls uh, holding stars with the imperial eagle. That's where the bird, I think, has come from the Imperial Eagle has survived as, as, as a bird. But again, very much distinctive from this particular sculpture. The heads too uh, are, are repeated in very similar form over and over again. And you'll notice the poor unfortunate individual being pierced in the eye has got the same tight fitting trousers that we saw earlier at Monaster Boys. But this particular sculpture, I think there's no lack of wit and ingenuity, and I mentioned adaptation, clever adaptation, sometimes of ideas, decorative ideas, which we can, you know, trace back to the early Christian era, as here with this extraordinary design on the right, uh, particularly that's Monaster Boys, but a version of it, Clumet Noise on the left, where you've got the bust surrounded by snakes, though there's a recent article or, or talk was given, I heard, where there was an argument that they were eels, um, not quite sure that I accept that, but anyway, they provide the frame and for animals framing busts is something you'll find, for example, on the Ravenna mosaics, but it's, it's very ingeniously done. And of course, then you've got what is often thought to be the blessing hand up above, and that's, uh, as it were, placed horizontally. So if you're kneeling down in front of the cross at this point, it would be directly, uh, directly above you. So um, uh, I, I see the sculptor, full of ideas, quite naturalistic in some cases with his animals, as you can see with the cat up there. And so one would love to know, well, where did he come from? Is he a local man? 
or was he a foreigner has sometimes been suggested. Indeed, one very firm suggestion some years ago was that he came from France, um, or at least there were craftsmen like him who came from France, um, folk who retreated, so it was thought, to Ireland in the ninth century after the death of Charles the Bold. But I can say really pretty categorically that it doesn't seem to be any evidence to suggest this or, 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 or demonstrate this whatsoever. There are countless details uh, in the work of this individual um, which suggest the Irish background. You see the spirals here on the right in the figure that it's, it's an angel uh, from a detail of an angel from Durrow that replicating the sort of thing you see in the book of Kells and wherever, um, whatever the ultimate origin of the iconography, and clearly it, it does owe a great deal, particularly I think back to the early Christian era, uh, I suspect most of it had been in Ireland for a good while. And even the use of the abstract designs, particularly unit spirals, uh, interlace of the sort of thing. He was a master of this as well. So it, his work is really very much of a piece with what one would expect from, from Ireland. Now, um, I think when it comes to creativity and innovation, uh, it, it's well worth looking at, at a number of scenes, particularly this one, The, the Last Judgment, because inevitably much of the literature has concentrated, focused on, on iconography. Um, and uh, uh, here we begin to encounter, and underlying it in a way, is that uh, now very familiar discourse about centre and periphery, which in this context, in an Irish context, has really been translated into the assumption that virtually all the iconography must have been imported from abroad, models must have been brought somehow from the centre, and by the centre, in other words, that this time that meant the Carolingian world. Um, and alongside that assumption has been another one, which is that the established canons of Christian iconography, something I mentioned earlier, that they um, will surely provide most of the answers. And, you know, the as I say, the canons of Christian iconography is reflected in the various iconographic uh, catalogues we have and resources like the, the Princeton Index of Christian Art, that they will give us the answers. Now, I, I think there are dangers, as I say, in doing that. First of all, because with the, the latter case, it presupposes that everything we've got in Ireland um, will be replicated somewhere abroad, and that isn't necessarily the case. And the last judgment that you see here the uh, at Muradat's Cross um, is, I think, a very good it, it example of that um, because it's one of the most extensive examples in early medieval art of a Last Judgment. Nothing like this at that time in the West. One would love to know what led Abbot Muradat to opt for such an extensive composition, and and fair enough, people naturally ask, well, where did it all come from? Well. I think the notion that there must have been an illustrious model somewhere, uh, which is what I think most uh, commentators have, have assumed, I think we need to stop and think about that because there isn't necessarily a, any good evidence for such an assumption because the last judgment is a special case in iconographical terms as there was no complete text to follow. As, as we all know that there are just hints of the Last Judgment scattered in various passages of the Bible. And as a result, it was rarely illustrated in early manuscripts and early versions of Last Judgments tend as a result to be quite a mix of elements and very varied as a consequence. And in fact, in a recent book um, by Neve Bala on the Byzantine Last Judgment, it's very interesting because she makes the point that there's no evidence for a standard model that was followed or replicated with any consistency in the early Middle Ages. In other words, to a large extent, each, each composition is sort of sui generis. But um, when it came to the Last Judgment as a subject, there was basically no lack of potential advisors in Ireland. The Irish monasteries produced 
a fair amount, a very considerable amount, in fact, of literature on eschatological matters in the form of hom homilies and tracts devoted to the world, the apocalypse, and indeed to the last judgment, and um, much deliberation and speculation on, on such matters. So what I would argue in view of all this is that it's possible, plausible, perhaps even likely, that at least some of what we see at Monaster Boyce may have been devised uh, close to home. And certainly one aspect of the Murdat master sculpture, his creativity, I think we can see here, particularly his concern and interest in, in very physical uh, details. I love the, uh, the uh, ironmongery here, the attention to all the hooks and the balances of the weighing scales. And down below, of course, we have the very skinny devil uh, lying flat on the ground, pulling at the, with a rod, pulling at one of the scales. And then the figure of a, a demon kicking the um, damned into hell uh, and a, not far behind him, an individual with a, with a quite large three pronged fork. There's a very interesting emphasis too in this composition on books, presumably a, a book of life and also a book of death or damnation. So that's one area where I think we, we, we mustn't necessarily just assume that uh, everything came from abroad. Uh, on the opposite side of um, the cross of, of, actually I've jumped again, uh, of, um, sorry about, I'm not quite sure that's happening. It's going, uh, jumping to about three slides further on. Anyway, this is, um, on the right is the crucifixion, the other side, the opposite side from the last judgment on Murdoch's cross. Um, and uh, next to it, I put the crucifixion on the neighboring cross, the tall cross of Master Boyce. And they make a really very interesting comparison. The Murdoch example, you can see Christ crucified with Stephaton and Longinus uh, behind, uh, as was um, the standard practice uh, in, in, in Ireland. But the same sculptor, as I say, responsible for the tall cross, which you see here, second time round, because I assume the tall cross is later, the second time round, his crucifixion is very different. And it's almost as if he's gone out of his way to avoid repetition. And uh, Stephaton and Longinus are still present, as you can see. But this time, Christ is clothed in the most extraordinary colobium, as if made of twisted linen strips. Now, th this is nothing new in Irish art, because 100, 150 years earlier, we'd have almost exactly the same thing uh, in the Gospel of uh, St. Gal, as to whether it was long, well, it's long thought to little more than an artistic device, which to some extent it may be, but one suspects that it's in origin, it was far more meaningful or deliberate uh, than that. Now still on the tall cross crucifixion, just to the uh, left and right of Christ's outstretched hands, you see there's a bar. And then beside that bar, uh, uh, very interesting crouching figures with animals. And these were first explained very uh, persuasively by the late Helen Rowe, who realized that um, here they are, that they were allusions to the prophecies of um, Isaiah. It's almost as if uh, on the left there's a figure perhaps milking, is it milking a sheep or, or shearing a sheep? And uh, she pointed to this passage in Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. I'm not sure whether I've seen this juxtaposition or uh, whether this juxtaposition, sorry, was uh, used or found in early Christian art. It may well have been, and I've just not, not found it, but um, it's, it's a very intriguing um, combination and demonstrates that, well, once again, that there's a lot of, a lot of uh, quite subtle thinking that has gone uh, in, into, this, um, into this particular composition and this particular version of the crucifixion. In fact, the, the crouching uh, figures are intriguing too, because um, they too seem to have their origin perhaps in uh, some of those late Roman um, uh, sarcophagus you can see there uh, on the right but um, be that as it may um, another aspect of the tall cross again um, which may I think 
be quite conscious and deliberate is the way the ring is handled. Now, the ring has a very interesting history and in it must ultimately go back to the idea of the Latin cross with a wreath around it. And that was really fortified and reinforced by the discovery um, or the appearance, perhaps I should say, of this extraordinary textile uh, in the Minneapolis Institute of Art, um, an Egyptian work. And there you see almost the Irish ring cross, as it were, in embryo. Um, but by the time we get to the uh, crosses that I'm dealing with, you can see there's no suggestion whatsoever really of a wreath or flowers or fruit or anything of that sort. It's as if that idea had long since been lost. But again, um, I think it's, um, it, 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 we can uh, sit, actually, sorry, we've jumped again. There we are. Um, if we go back and we just look at some of the literature that one finds in the Irish monasteries at this time, we can begin to see perhaps how they might have uh, looked at the particular, uh, the ring in itself. And they certainly weren't thinking of it in terms of the reef as a sign of triumph, Christ's triumph over, over death has been the case, of course, in the early Christian era. Um, but it was the, the, the Dutch scholar, Keith Wielenturth, who pointed out this passage in a tract known as the Avenue Tongue. Um, and it really, reading that, you can see how, uh, or what sort of ideas people may have had when they see the ring so appropriate, the cosmos, it is as a circle that the circuit of the majestic heaven is seen and the circuit of the sun and the moon is rounded. All of this is fitting for the Lord is as a circle without beginning or end. So the ring has, as it were, been metamorphosized in terms of its meaning, I think, in, a, in an Irish context. But even more so than that, uh, it's striking that in this particular case, as you can see in the detail at the bottom left, the ring is made up of bosses and little bits of interlace. Now, they must surely have been painted. And when painted up, they would have looked like annals, uh, uh, like enamels and presumably uh, gold filigree. And of course, that's exactly what we find around the outside, around the outer rim of that fantastic pattern, the Derinaflam pattern, which was found just 40 years ago. And so when looking at this cross, it's almost as if you're seeing Christ's body laid out as it were, on the type of pattern which would have been very familiar to the uh, perhaps the wealthier monasteries of, of the day. So there's a lot of, I think, thought, originality lying behind the work of the, the Muradat master. And one other uh, text that I just want to draw attention to uh, in this context, um, it comes from the poems of an uh, individual called Blomach, uh, writing in the eighth century. And what, what he's left us with is a, uh, a series, well, it's, it's, it's a lengthy poem really on the passion of Christ, consisting of a series of short verses. And uh, they include some br very brief comments, which could almost be a description of some of the panels on the crosses. And this one in particular, this is Blomack on the right, uh, talking about the mocking of Christ. Uh, a purple cloak was put about the king by the ignoble assembly in mockery that was put about him, not from a desire to cover him. The son of the God, the father, a reed, significantly see Christ is holding the reed, was put in his hand. It was said clearly to mock him that he was king of the Jews. And of course, king is vital because uh, or, or the, that, that surely explains why Christ is shown with the Penanian brooch, a mark of status, obviously, in Irish society. And so when painted, it's almost as if Blomack's passage is a description um, of what we see on the cross, except, of course, that it was written about 150 years before the carving. Um, so from this one gets an impression that such images were already familiar, perhaps not just in textual form, but familiar to uh, the Irish monastic world, uh, perhaps even uh, in, in, in art and imagery of some sort, be that painted panels or even wood carving. Now, one aspect of the crosses, um, which, or the study of the crosses, I should say, 
which is really rarely if ever mentioned is any interest in local saints. And that's a curious submission because there's a huge reverence, obviously, for the local Irish saints at this time, the founding fathers of so many of the monasteries. Um, and, and one might have expected to see more of them on the crosses or more uh, element, perhaps, from their hagiographies. And there's no shortage uh, of them. But I think this may actually, in part, be a failure to recognize them here at Old Kilcullen. Um, there's a very curious panel you can see here. This is not a sculpture, incidentally, by the Miradak master, but you see a figure with an axe with, leaning over, again, some prostrate individual below and holding a crozier with a square, well, little square, presumably a book of some sort and a bell uh, beside, uh, beside him. Now, in recent literature, this has been described as Cain in the act of killing Abel again following, as it were, searching for, a, I suppose, a standard theme in the canon of Christian iconography. But that ignores the, well, the axe, but also ignores the crozier, the bell, and what I think one has to take as the book, because the book, bell and crozier, were the standard insignia of abbots, the comarbs, the founders of, um, the founders of Irish monasteries. And so who was the founder of Old Kilcullen is the obvious thing. Well, it's a man called McTall, a follower from Patrick, reputed to be anyway. And that might not seem hugely significant until one realizes what the word tall actually means in Irish. It means axe or adze. So there he is with his axe. So this is Mac, Mac Tall, Mac the axe, so to speak. He is the founder of um, old Kilcullen, complete with the attributes of a founder, Bell Book and Crozier. And I see that as him triumphing over uh, paganism. Um, and then another candidate we've got for a monastic founder, I think maybe on uh, this panel on Muradat's cross, again, one which hasn't been uh, very plausibly interpreted in the past. We've got a, a, a ecclesiastic to the left with a very impressive crozier firing right into the, uh, in terms of a direction that is, into the mouth of a, a large bird. And then a figure reeling backwards with a long beard that I think we can reasonably assume is a king of some sort. But most interesting is what the ecclesiastic is holding. It's, it's clearly a flabellum and you can just about make out the marks of a cross on it. So I think this, um, you know, we have to assume that 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 that, that this is uh, again a, perhaps a piece of hagiography, perhaps relating to the founder of Monastery Boys, Saint Buit himself. Again, overcoming the forces of evil, the forces of paganism. Virtually every Irish saint was praised for their capacity to expel evil forces, and so it's very tempting to assume that this is what we're getting here. The final example of a saint. Uh, appearing um, is much more explicit and better known on the cross of the scriptures at Clonmac Noise. This is carries, this cross carries badly damaged inscriptions, which appear to mention both the high king of the time, King Flan Sinner, who died in 916, and a certain Coleman, Abbot Coleman. And this, uh, the annals tell us that these two men built the stone church at Clonmac Noise, which is what you see there uh, in the background. And here facing the church, it's the opposite side of the cross actually, is the panel with two figures, one an ecclesiastic, the other again, I think a bearded king holding up a staff. And um, that actually uh, ties in beautifully with a passage in the life of St. Kieran written almost certainly, or known at least, almost certainly at the time the cross was uh, being made. It's a foundation scene and fits quite nicely into patterns of foundation scenes. And so it's presumably St. Kieran with um, the high king of the day of, the, of several hundred years earlier uh, at Dermot, the ancestor, in other words, of the current uh, high king. So this panel is more than just a uh, recognition of St. Kieran. It's actually uh, directly relevant to current events because the year 909, when the church was built and presumably the cross carved, was a time, well, 
just followed a, a great victory that um, that King Flan Sinner had achieved over the King of Munster. And um, it's almost now he was almost consciously repeating the work of one of his great ancestors of four centuries before, effectively as a reenactment of the past, a refoundation re uh, of the, the monastery. And um, down below we have these seeds of three riders. This is on the base of the cross of the scriptures and two chariots. And there've been uh, brave attempts to interpret these in biblical terms, particularly in the context of the Psalms. But I think um, most visitors, most of those who looked at these scenes in the early 10th century, one imagine would have looked at them somewhat differently and seen them as a display of contemporary political and uh, political and military power. And I was very struck looking at the Duckling Cross in, in, in Scotland. Uh, and there you there's quite explicitly here, you've got uh, the King, uh, as you can see, uh, Constantin of Ferguson, and then down below, there are four of his, uh, his armed warriors uh, with their spears. And so it, the meaning there, perhaps a bit more clear cut than it is in Ireland, but it certainly encourages me to think that the Irish audience would have looked at those panels on the bases, like the two you see here in much more contemporary political terms than necessarily in uh, biblical terms. Though that's not to exclude the possibility, of course, that a devout monk might see things uh, very, very differently. So, uh, in fact, most of the crosses that I've been talking about, I think, have some sort of political dimension in the sense that the individuals behind them had were men of great status in society. At Monaster Boys, we have Muirdak. Now, Muirdak was no ordinary abbot. His, his obit in the annals tell us that he was, well, High steward of the Southern O'Neill. In other words, he's working for Flan Sinner, who is the, the, the high king uh, of the time. He's a pluralist. Um, he's also deputy abbot uh, of Armagh while being abbot of uh, Monaster Boyce. Uh, an influential figure too in the local kingdom of Briga. I think in some way one can barely even think of him really in monastic terms. He's a, he's, he's, he's a, he's a very major and prominent figure uh, in, in the local area. And then at, uh, at Kells, where the sculptor also will, we have this figure, Mael Brichta, likewise a pluralist, abbot of both Armagh and Kells, which meant, incidentally, of course, being abbot of Kells meant that he was also head of the entire Columban Federation, including Iona. And he was a colleague um, of, uh, effectively, of, uh, of Murdoch. Um, because, uh, uh, as we've seen, Muirdat was deputy abbot of Armagh, where Mael Brigta was. And then at Clonmac Noise, we have uh, King Flan himself. So there's a kind of network of high profile individuals, uh, both secular and, uh, and, and uh, uh, religious. So that while I'm doubting that the crosses were certainly spectacular, assertions of the Christian faith at the same time they were enhancing the history and I think the status of particular monasteries and presumably too in that process the status of the individuals who commissioned them and as I've tried to show and I hope I have demonstrated um, they were so firmly embedded in Irish society in so many different ways in both society and of course in Irish religious practice. So this is surely a case uh, where the periphery, as it were, dominated the, um, dominated the, uh, uh, the centre. And um, I would have liked to say a little bit more, but my time is up. I would have liked to say a little bit more about uh, the connections between this sculpture and Romanesque, but I'll have to leave that um, for another day. Perhaps the one big surprise, though, is that despite these extraordinary achievements which we are looking at here, um, I'm not sure why I'm leaving you here with the uh, beard pulling, but um, despite these ex extraordinary achievements, the, um, the high crosses really had very little 
influence in later Irish sculpture. When we get to the Romanesque era, they were, it seems as if they are virtually ignored. And the other thing which is equally odd, the whole art of cross carving seemed to lapse not long after Muradat's cross and those other great crosses uh, were made. And um, why that happened? There was simply no continuity, as far as we know, of course, chronology is a, it, it, the cross is a very tricky subject, but it does seem that major cross carving of the type we're looking at at Monaster Voice really did fizzle out within a decade or two later. And that's, uh, to say, not easy to explain, but it is, of course, just one of the many conundrums which make, um, make Irish cross carving such an intriguing subject. And as I suppose, keep all of those who are, are those of us who are interested in Irish sculpture uh, in business. Anyway, it's time for me to stop. But if you are interested in these things, well, um, I have just the volume for you. <laughs> but um, I better say no more about that. And if you have been listening, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Roger. And uh, we're giving you a, a silent but hearty clap. Uh, you mentioned a uh, very interesting issue there about the, uh, or non-issue really, uh, you know, the lack of influence these things seem to have had. And perhaps people have questions to ask you about that because it's a rather uh, interesting issue. Various other things uh, people might like to ask about local iconography or, you know, at least, uh, region specific iconography people might have ideas about that uh, yeah, or anything else really so if you type your questions into the q a box i'd be grateful there's a couple in there already so roger with your permission i'll read these to you margaret cormack asks on top of the monos voice cross a reliquary seems to be indicated could that be correct maybe to the knowledgeable relics of the founding saint question yes that's a very interesting idea because um uh, th there's been a lot of discussion about those extraordinary capstones and uh comparisons have been made with the the uh, uh the temple as depicted in the book of Kells, but more closely of course with the um uh with reliquaries of one sort or another and there have been suggestions even that um in that it's just possible that reliquaries, perhaps in a in wooden, if there were wooden crosses that preceded these, as some people might imagine, were reliquaries ever actually physically placed there, or were relics placed up the top? Well, there's no evidence. I mean, there's no clear evidence for it, but it's an attractive idea, and particularly so, of course, if one side of it depicts. Uh, a local saint, except, of course, on the other side. In fact, all four sides at Monaster Boyce on Muridat's Cross have got to, have got to imagery. Paul and Anthony is on the north side, and then we've got the Ascension on the other. So it isn't entirely consistent with the local saint, but it's certainly a view, an idea which, you know, has been uh, put forward in the past and is 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 intriguing. And indeed, um, the relationship between the stone crosses and relics uh, and how they you know how they might have been associated with the crosses mm. is something which you know we're thinking about but it's just lack of really hard hard evidence okay thank you very much now there are two questions which are similar and i'll take as one leslie smith asks what is the significance of the small figures at the bases and Alison stones asks there are two, or says there are two little creatures at the bottom of one of the crosses. Could they be based on lions, as in Italian sculpture? Okay. Yes. Oh, there, there there's, there's quite a. Uh, sorry, I should have dwelt on that. We've got signs of the zodiac on some of the bases, and then we've got an extraordinary menagerie of animals of uh, post sort of classical type of animals. So there's, there's clearly there, there's circulating there. There's access to um well one how it came one doesn't know some would argue through the carolingian world others might argue it came uh, very much earlier in fact with uh, the mirror that's because you've got really two types you've got a a, a relatively low relief uh, 
type of animal um, very much based on classical sources. And then you've got much more naturalistic ones, but again, um, uh, and then they're very different from the incredibly stylized insular type uh, snakes and so on. So, you know, that there are a lot of, a lot of different strands to the to the animal ornament. I'm not quite sure when they mention at the very base, on one side you have the, the, the beard pullers and um, yes, you've got two, you've animals with contorted heads twisting round. Yes, you've got quite a quite a group and not just on, on Murdoch's Cross, of course, but Murdoch's Cross is the star in which mm. you know you see more of, of these things. Okay. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, the next question is from a comment question is from Laura Cleaver. Uh, thank you, Roger. What a treat that was. How many people do you think were involved in carving crosses at any point in time in the period you've been looking at? How big that is? How big was the industry? Yes, I don't think it was that big. And I think um, because if you take a, take one of these crosses, how long would it take to carve and how many people would you need? Now, the uh, the first thing is. Uh, it wouldn't be that easy to have two people carving one of those slabs of stone simultaneously. You could probably do it, but you wouldn't want more than two at the most. And I think it's more likely you'd have one. We did, I, I was involved in a, a very interesting discussion looking at French tympanum, or, or tympanum at one point. And we were looking at the Bewley tympanum, I forget how many pieces of stone it has, something like 24. And we were thinking, we worked it out that, you know, if, if each of those could be carved in about two or three weeks, well, much of that could all have been done in a year, year and a half, which isn't that great. And I think the same could almost be said for some of these crosses. And I would like to see, I'd suggest that Murdoch's cross could have been done by one man and his assistant, maybe over the course of a year or two, rather than a mass produce, you know, a whole team. And one of the things that would encourage me in that direction is it's very, very consistent in its style. Um, and it's consistent to, the fact that the same type of interlace, same patterns of interlace are used on Murdoch's cross on other crosses. So I, 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 I think you're gonna need a lot of people around when you turn the crosses and shift them and move them and things. But once in place, I would tend to see one man and one or two assistants, you're gonna to have to have somebody to uh, sharpen his chisels, a blacksmith there, there at the same time. Um, so that would be my, you know, mm. my guess. Thank you very much. That, that will satisfy Laura. But. <laughs> uh, Philip, Philip Lancaster, uh, Lancaster is the next question I've got here. These very interesting questions, and I hope people bear, bear with us because uh, there's a number of them there, although not so many more. But anyway, Philip's question is, have any traces of colour ever been found on the crosses? Though, no. if it has... It could have been applied sometime after the crosses were created, of course. Yeah, so you say no, Roger, yeah. No, and I think, uh, yeah, and as you say, even if you did find it, you wouldn't know what period. But it's that in itself raises an interesting point because I think the assumption must be they were painted. The extent to which they're painted, um, you, you know, there have been temptations to put very intense colour on them. You know, almost use the Book of Kells as a and perhaps that's unlikely, but um, I do feel that the particular sculptor I've been focusing on tonight, he's so keen on all these little local details, the brooches, the swords and so on, they're almost crying, or indeed the bosses. And I think those bosses, they just have to have been painted because- Yeah, uh, I suppose, a, I think, a, a, sorry, Roger, I'm, I'm yeah, very sorry. I, I, think, I think we're safe on that. And the fact that you've got evidence from Anglo-Saxon crosses, albeit it might be late evidence. So to be very, strange if you cross from England to Ireland and look at the crosses here and suddenly find they're all plain how boring you know so that but then the the next question comes how frequently would you need to repaint them if they're standing out there in the open and then what sort of um, and you see the sandstone you're going to need some sort of ground on it uh, you know to take you might get away with it in a very smooth you know, carboniferous limestone, but on, on that you wouldn't. Uh, so it raises very interesting. And I wonder actually whether they weren't maintained very well. And by the 12th century, one of the reasons that, you know, 
in some cases they weren't taken as much notice of maybe they were already all covered with moss and goodness knows what but that's a really interesting question the extent to which they continued to be revered in the middle ages and mm. were actually you know looked after i suppose a corollary to philip's question might be how closely people looked for traces of color or or yeah or underlay you know on them yeah um i suspect the problem may have really arise in the middle of the 19th century when the people got very interested in them and started brushing and scratching and you know doing their best to clean certainly early photographs show some of them um you know really literally covered in in growth of one sort or another uh, so you know ma massive cleaning has taken place and it, uh, and of course until relatively recently they were sprayed against lichen and things so i think it, it, it's not altogether surprising that all trace of color will would ha, would have gone. Um, mm. Okay, thank you very much. Brian and Morigitos ask. Uh, they say thank you very much indeed, Roger, for a fascinating lecture and book. How much uh, very fine detail do you think has been lost, or is what we see close to the finished form? I think it's. I think. Well, you see. I've cheated because I've tended to show you the best preserved examples. And so, um, and in, in, in the cases, some of the cases at Modest Boys to a less extent at Clum McNoise, you know, they, uh, the preservation does seem very, really, really remarkably good given, you know, a thousand years, but clearly we've lost detail um, even in those cases. Um, and I, my guess is it, you know, when you begin to look at things like the ornament and the interlace, I'm sure it was a bit sharper than we see it now. But I mean, it is quite impressive. There was a, um, I'm not sure who he was, but the uh, the Office of Public Words about a few years back had, um, uh, well, they've had various uh, consultants look at the stone at Modest Voice, and they, one of them from England was, was immensely impressed at how well Muradat's cross had withstood whatever it was, you know, 1100, 1200 years of being exposed outside. But then on the other side, there are many, many, and even in Monaster Boyce uh, on the tall cross, those panels I showed at the beginning, very badly worn. And so it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very mixed picture. And of course, in many cases, the sculptures almost vanished entirely. Sure. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Neve Whitfield asks, could you say something about the reappearance of some scenes, such as the devil cheated, cheating at the last judgment, trying to pull down the scales in later Romanesque art? How do you explain this? Well, um, not sure that I can. Uh, <laughs> um, but quite a few of those sort of things do turn up later in Romanesque. Art. I mean, when you think actually a conch or a ton, um, they're not exactly the same, but you get the same sort of principles of the, the, the um, as, I mean, particularly when damned are being thrust into hell and so on. Uh, and so really all I was trying to suggest there is that there's an element in which he's, uh, you know, the sculptor is obviously adapting, could be to a text for all we know, and is inspired to do it in, their, his own particular way, but she's quite right. That particular scene of the interfering of the scales is 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 not uncommon. But then you see quite a lot of things that we we see. I didn't have a chance to show you, but uh, whether it's the um, the pulling of beards or the uh, wrestling scenes, they're there, and you know, um, and that's really where the main arguments or many of the arguments that where, how did this stuff come into Ireland? Did it come in at a very early stage or has it all swept in, you know, as has been suggested really on a tide of Carolingian influence. And while I wouldn't doubt that there are obviously going to be connections with the Carolingian world, I just think we shouldn't exaggerate the extent to which that took place. Thank you. Virginia Johnson, uh, wonderful talk, informative, clear, many topics touched upon. Thanks, Roger. 
I wondered whether there was any evidence of ceremonies that took place around the crosses, or were they mainly commemorative? I mean, not the didactic type, which you discussed early on, but liturgical or other such ceremonies. Um, now, there's been a lot of interest on this uh, recently, but in terms of historical evidence, actually, um, it's very difficult to come by. So it's largely, um, I mean, we know there were paths to the mon monasteries, which appear uh, to have linked crosses together. So clearly, you know, there were pilgrims or, or you know, there were, there were liturgical events which, which involved the crosses. But beyond that, it's, it's, it's hard to know where you go or how far you can go um, and whether, you know, what, what sort of ceremonies. It's, I mean, it's so plausible and so likely, and there must have been feast days, you know, the, um, you would have thought the exhortation of the cross and things like that, you know, it's just asking, you know, one can only expect that such things would take place, assuming it wasn't raining, but maybe rain didn't bother them. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, but, uh, you know, there are people who've looked at that far more, uh, uh, far more effectively and knowledgeably than, than, than I have. Um, uh, Eamon O'Carrigan would be the, the principal person who's, you know, who's really explored that uh, area. And it's, 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 in a sense, trying to tie in what we see with uh, liturgy of the day and, and how close that, that can be. Certainly, it's, I think it's, it's much more, what we see is much more closely tied in with um, uh, the writing, the homilies, the, the sermons, which which are now being increasingly studied, which wasn't the case, you see, 30 or 40 years ago. So that's been uh, really quite a revelation. Mm, thank you very much, Roger. OK, Christine Sabashvili asks, she says, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I'm interested if there are stone crosses, earlier stone crosses, and if the iconography is similar or differs from each other and how it differs. Um, now the group I was looking at are around 900, and the 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 big question in Ireland is when did these large green crosses first go up and appear? And um, very different views on that. There was a, a time when uh, some were placed very early on, um, and of course you've got to consider how they fit with those, for example, at Iona and and and, and Scotland. Um, but the the uh, I think the safest early group we've got of crosses are those at uh, Cromwell Noise, which don't really have. There's a group that really uh, are not decorated with figure sculpture. They they have animals and 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 various other ornamental patterns. But there's quite a substantial group, and they appear to belong to the early ninth century, best part of a, a century before what we're looking at. So, and then in between them you've got. Crosses like those at Moon and Castle Dermot, which used to be thought they, they have this extraordinary, uh, very geometrical style as if it's based on uh, metalwork. And quite early dates were always given for them, but some of their iconography is very close to what I've been talking about. And I'm interested in the engineering because the engineering ties up and I tend to see that as something they move towards. So they got increasingly ambitious in other words. Um, so uh, the answer to that, that question would be, I think that that not long before, it, it seems as if it's it's only perhaps the later ninth, early 10th century that you begin to get this huge interest in decorating them with figure sculpture and all this Christian uh, imagery in a way that it's hard to trace back all that far. But as I say, that would be a very contentious area. Okay, thank you. Well, what you said about engineering is germane to the next question. Deborah Khan asks, would you say a little more about the engineering of the crosses and particularly the form of the bases? Were they for stability? Well, that's, that's interesting because um, I was looking a few months ago at some of the Pictish crosses and they, some of them have a large base like that, but some do not. And in one or two cases, they're 
across slabs were set straight into the ground, in fact, in a stone, but you don't see the stone standing up. And uh, the fact that these stones are, are, you know, several feet high off the ground creates considerable problems for erecting them, because that's, it, it, if you just had a hole in the ground, you could rotate the cross and let it just drop in naturally. So that, that meant that that stone base was really significant and important. And long ago, Helen Rowe, who, and I'm a big fan of Helen Rowe as a, a, as a writer uh, and, um, and scholar, but she tied up the idea of the base uh, with Calvary and the Rock of Calvary, even to the steps at the very top of some of the Irish bases. And that would seem to fit, particularly when you looked at the things like the Egyptian textile that I showed, again, a big solid base, as if that really signified uh, or, or you know, direct you, you straight to Calvary. And that was the idea. But the extent to which you know, that, that may, may have been important at a, at a stage when, I don't know, the, the first crosses were being made to the extent to which that that meaning was retained or then converted into something quite different. And, you know, you'd be hard pushed to say, well, what, what are all these armies doing wandering across the base if it's kind of has suggestions that this is to represent Calvary? You know, that, that isn't so easy to you know, to explain. But I, uh, yeah, the answer to it is yes, those big bases are clearly meaningful and it, it, it has to take us back to Calvary, I think. Thanks very much, Roger. Martin Hennig says, wonderful lecture. Are there any elements which might relate to sexual, to secular sources such as the Tain? Ah, um, yeah, rope is one. They talk about rope quite a bit in the time. And um, then they've got, um, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, a lot of violence, of course, uh, in, 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 in that. Uh, but uh, yes, there is some, but not, I think, anything specific. I, I've read I, when I've read the text of the text, I, it's always been just looking for clues about rope and stone and things like this rather perhaps than its actual significant content. But yeah, it, it, interesting point. I'm not sure I can answer it properly. I'll have to go back and have a closer look or closer think. Okay, and final question from Mina Miyamoto. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I'm interested in the influence of representation on Romanesque sculpture, particularly the Bazio beard puller was it written about in your book, your 2019 book? Um, I didn't say very much, I don't think, about beard pulling. Um, there's a whole sub-literature on beard pulling, as you can imagine. Um, uh, it's interesting that it's there in the Book of Kells. I didn't have a chance to talk about that. There are quite a few beard pullers in Pearl. And, um, and of course, it's the sort of thing, there it is in Romanesque, uh, later on, but is it something inherited from the Roman world? Very interesting. Uh, one of the tales that folk in Ireland know very well is the famous story of um, King John when he was still Prince John. He came to Ireland and um, he, um, you know, at his court there, the Irish kings came. And the story, according to Geraldus Cambrensis, is that John, Prince John, did the unthinkable and pulled the beards of these Irish kings, which was not, uh, not a sensible thing to have done. Um, so the beard was very much, um, and you can always sense this from the carvings, was a sign of wisdom, status, and venerability, and that, that sort of thing. So that's one thing I just take from the Irish beard pullers, but as you can well imagine, there have been all sorts of ideas, theories attached, sexual and you name it, um, it's there. And all sorts of fantastic um, iconographical gymnastics to try and explain why you've got beard pullers at the foot of the cross. Um, but I've forgotten what the arguments are, but <laughs> I tend to see them as beard pullers and not go too far beyond that. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much, Roger. I'm sure that would have been useful to the questioner. Uh, that's all the questions we've got. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for the amount of trouble you've taken to answer them. Can I just remind people who are still here, and that is most people, that our next lecture will be on the 2nd of February, and Naomi Speakman is going to speak on the topic of antiquarian societies and scholarly networks, collectors, curators, and conferences. Uh, what we hope to do on the 2nd of February is have the postponed 12th night party uh, we're not sure about, obviously, about what the uh, arrangements are going to be for any of this. I mean, if we're still unable to meet, then we won't be able to have the 12th night party. Uh, but uh, in any case, Richard Plant, the uh, association's publicity officer, will be sending an email around about that in due course. So, so thanks. Um, Thank you very much, Roger. It was terrific to hear all of that. I had questions which I'm not going to ask you because we, you've, you've endured enough. But, uh, yeah, if people could sort of uh, just clap at home silently and uh, I'll do the same. And thank you very much indeed. Okay, Roger. Well, goodbye and goodbye, everybody else.